fact you have that vision, that biblical vision from Isaiah 11 and Revelation 21 and Romans 8 and 1 Corinthians 15 and all over the place, once you have that, then your doctrine of salvation looks different as well. As if salvation is simply leaving this world and going to heaven, you construe how you get saved one way, but if salvation means being part of God's new creation, then you construe it in very different ways. And just a word for those who know about these things, and don't worry if you don't, the so-called new perspective on Paul, with which I have been associated, though actually there are about 17 different types of new perspective out there at the moment, so don't worry too much about that. Nevertheless, part of the point of that is an attempt to get at this vision of eschatology and to see how that works back in Paul himself. Sorry, that's a bit of an aside, really. That was my second contemporary reflection. My third one, which is, which is much more important, is that this is not, stress not, an elite activity. Theology is an every member occupation. One of my favorite little moments from my time in Durham uh, Durham is very, basically a very poor diocese. There's a sort of cappuccino belt which runs up through the middle of the diocese, but to left and right, it's old industrial wasteland. The steel is gone, the coal is gone. They're not building ships anymore. The fisheries have been decimated by European regulations. The farmers had foot and mouth. Lots of poverty, lots of unemployment. And yet some struggling little congregations where people still turn up to beginner's theology groups on a Wednesday evening or whatever it may be. And I would go to those groups at the beginning and end of their course. And I remember one time giving out certificates to people significantly older than me. And I remember one little old lady coming up to me with her eyes shining as, as I gave her her certificate. And she said, you know, I found out something. She said, once you get into this stuff, you'll never be bored again as long as you live. And I thought, yes, that's what it's all about. You know, she hadn't been to college, but she discovered that theology is for her as well not an elite activity. Only so will the church be the church. And there's many a wise clergy person, preacher, pastor, who knows that actually, after the sermon, this lady here, that gentleman there, they may not have any formal theological training, but their one word of comment will be the thing that the wise preacher or pastor really needs to hear. They'll have had that insight. But the centre of it all, and I'm going to close with this. I've been talking for an hour, I see. Goodness, um, jet lag. Um, the centre of it all, the centre of it all is prayer. Prayer and theology are not two separate activities. And so often, and this is part of the Enlightenment again, we've treated theology as organising these concepts, reading these books, writing these papers, whatever it is, and then prayer is the sort of pious bit that you do at the side. No. They've got to flow into and out of one another. That wonderful poem by George Herbert, which ends, something understood. It's about prayer, and that's about theology. In the book, I talk about one of the most famous and noblest rabbis of them all, Rabbi Akiba. Akiba supported Bar Kokhva, who led the revolt against Rome in 132 AD. Hadrian had produced some anti-Jewish legislation, was going to ban circumcision. Some countries in Europe trying to do that at the moment, interestingly. Um, and he was also going to turn Jerusalem into a thoroughgoing pagan city at last. And some of the Jews said, that's it, this must be the time for God to act. And we think this man, Simeon ben Kozibar, will call him the son of the star, Bar Kokhba. He's the Messiah. And Akibar said, yes, he is the Messiah. Some of his friends disagreed, but Akibar stuck with it. The revolt lasted three years. And at the end of the three years, the Romans came and did what the Romans did best, caught them and killed them. And as they were torturing Rabbi Akiba to death, which they did by combing his flesh with steel combs, he was praying the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Echad, one. And some of his disciples who were there said, Master, how can you still be praying this even under these circumstances? And he said, all my life I have loved him with my heart and my mind and my strength. And I've wondered what it would mean to love him with my life. And now that I have the chance to do it, shall I not take it? And he died with the word Echad on his lips. That's a noble vision. Now Paul has taken that Shema prayer 
And in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, he has discovered the crucified and risen Jesus at the heart of it. And I sometimes think, and of course we don't know this, and it's pure fantasy, Paul in prison. A few weeks ago I stood in the house recently excavated, which some archaeologists think is where Paul was kept under house arrest. Uh, we don't know that for sure. We don't know any of that stuff for sure. But still, I was thinking about this then. Paul in prison, knowing that the time has come, waiting for the executioner. It would be kinder than Akibar. It would just be a sword because he was a citizen. But I imagine Paul praying that same prayer only as you find it in 1 Corinthians 8. Alhemin his theos hapater exuta panta kahemis is out on. Kahis kirios Jesus Christos. Dihuta panta kahemis diatu. One God the Father, from whom are all things, and we to him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and we through him. That's the heart of Christian prayer, rooted in the Jewish tradition, reworked dangerously, radically around the crucified and risen Messiah. It's the heart of Christian theology, I suggest it's the heart of Christian prayer.